Good morning, everyone. And good morning to the shares and the family, and especially to little Tate. You'll see him just now, a little bubbly one. We are going to baptize him today. What a blessing that is. So welcome to the family, both near and far. Um, we are very, very grateful that we can share in this wonderful experience with you. We all need a pamphlet and then the English hymn book um, for this service. Today is an English traditional service. Next week we'll have a German communion service. Um, if you have a look at the pamphlet, all the announcements are there, the upcoming services, birthdays, and everything else that you need there. And we wish Uncle Werner Backebach a happy birthday today. After the service, as usual, there will be tea and coffee. And today, the offering is for theological education. We've got a few um, students who are studying theology. Um, and with this money, we help support them, make it possible for them to study. And um, we will also keep them in prayer today in the church prayer. Please have a look at the announcements. Next, this coming Sunday, we'll have another baptism, and next, well, this, the next baptism that this coming Sunday will be in the CC, that will be Caleb Rankin-Bond, the son of Chris Bond and Amy Rankin-Bond, and the grandson of Kurt and V. Rankin. So please keep them in your prayers. And today, the Katie camp begins. Um, that is for the 12 to 16-year-olds down at Kailaga Platz. This last week was Kailaga, and my two youngest went there, and they really enjoyed it. They came back quite sunburnt, and they smelled like the beach, but that was, that's wonderful. They really had a lot of fun. So please keep uh, that whole camp this coming week in your prayers as well. Uh, just so you know, you can also go camp there. You can hire the facilities there, and it's really, really lovely as a private individual or family. For, there's something unique in the announcements today. If you have a look at them, um, this is the finance update. So in our church, we refer to the part of tithing that is contributed directly to the local congregation as contributions. And in our congregation, the two main sources of income are contributions and fundraising. And our budget for contributions, you can see it there, is 1.7. At the end of May, we were 20% behind in the actual contributions, and a letter was sent out recently, and you can have a look at that. Today, we will be celebrating communion finally in the front again. After two years of celebrating with these prepackaged elements in our seats, we are going to celebrate communion in the front. That's very normal. It wouldn't be baptism without a child protesting. <laughs> so that's lovely. So everybody who wants to come to the front to receive communion, at the, at, when it's time for communion, you'll be invited to come in, your, in groups again, as it was before. And, and we will only be using the small um, chalices, not the one big one that we'll share. That's the one difference. And the counselor will come and share the wafers with the words, the body of Christ given for you. And I will come with the juice or the wine. On each tray, there's juice or wine. The lighter color is juice and the darker one is the wine. There is also one other difference. Those who still want to have communion in their seats with, the, with those prepackaged ones can do so. If you would like to celebrate communion like that, um, if, even if you're feeling a little bit under the weather, that's always a good idea. You may raise your hand now, and Andrew will bring you one. So if you'd like one, please raise your hand, and you can stay seated where you are, and we will celebrate communion. We celebrate the service in the name of God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we sing the first hymn. I think we all know it, Mighty God. We praise your name in the hymn book, number 457, 457, Mighty God, we praise your name. That in German would be Großer Gott.
ask you to stand. Let us pray with words from Psalm 103. Let us pray. Praise the Lord my soul, all my inmost being. Praise His holy name. Praise the Lord my soul and forget not all His benefits. Who forgives all our sins and heals all our diseases. Who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. Who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, how could we ever thank you enough that we may be gathered here together, that we can share communion together, and that we may be here to witness and observe and to baptize little Tate. Heavenly Father, you are a good, patient Father. You are righteous and holy, and you walk with us, sometimes you exhort us, challenge us, but you always seek mercy. Heavenly Father, we ask that you help us today to come to you with everything that we are, from our nerves to our worries to our joys, to our deepest questions to come as we are into your presence. Thank you that we may know that you are here in this very church building with us. How amazing it is to think that you, enthroned in heaven above, being praised and glorified by all the heavenly hosts, are here with us in this church building. Please to have your son come to you today, little Tate, and be baptized pleased that we are here with you as well. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. We are going to sing, Dearest Jesus, we are here, after which we will baptize little Tate.
may I ask the family and Tate and the godparents to come to the front. Hello, Tate. Yo. Hey. Uh, I'll warm it up. I've got water there. Yeah. There we go. Shut. Sure. Yeah. Dear Andrew and Crystal, Bianca, and Bronwyn, who is one of the godparents who couldn't make it today, um, I have spoken with her directly and asked her the same vow and promise that I will ask them, and she has already given her yes with the help of God. So dear Andrew and Crystal, Bronwyn and Bianca, you have come to have Tate Anderson share baptized. Our Lord Jesus Christ commanded his church to baptize, and we obey his command, trusting in his promise. For in Matthew 28, Jesus says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I will be with you always to the very end of the age. Let us pray. Mighty and eternal Father, we thank you that we can come to you with Tate to be baptized with this gift, this sacrament that you've given us to remind us to, that we can see your blessing, your grace, your mercy, your sacrifice physically and to receive it. And we pray for Tate that you receive him, wash him clean, forgive him, Lord Jesus, grant him a new spirit. Grant him the gift of your Holy Spirit in this baptism. And our Heavenly Father, we ask for your blessing and strength on the parents and godparents. In Jesus' name, amen. So, parents and godparents, God's Word teaches us that all human beings, and including ourselves and our children, that's you too, are under the power of sin and death. But God's Word also teaches us that Jesus died for us. And He died for you, little Tate. Yes, He did. He didn't stay on the cross, but He rose again, and He reigns forever. And one day, you will understand that. Through baptism, we physically see the free invitation of the blessing of Jesus' saving work, namely His forgiveness, the forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. That baptism is not our expression of faith towards God, but it's physically an expression of God's faithfulness to us. So baptism is something that God does for us, and that is why we baptize children. It is all God's doing for us. It is His forgiveness, His grace that is available to us all and will always be available to Tate. And so remember also these words from Mark 16 verse 16. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. It is by faith through grace that we are, by God's grace, that we are saved. And therefore, you must teach him of God's love and mercy so that he will also choose Jesus for himself one day, so that he can also be with us in heaven when Jesus comes again. And that is your task as parents and godparents and as us as a congregation to take responsibility for this little one who's not too happy at the moment, hey? <laughs> to show him the love of Jesus. Maybe he can play with this. I don't know if he wants to. Do you see that? That's got your name on it. There we go. You raise him up in the, sh in the church. No? Read the Bible with him. Pray for him. Pray with him. Be an example to him in your life. Bring him to church so that he can get, get to know his family, his brothers and sisters in Dundee or wherever God may lead you, so that he may also know Jesus for himself. This is not an easy task, especially for his parents. That's why you have support and the support of your loved ones and everyone around you. But we'll also keep you, we'll pray for you for, your God's, for God's blessing for you. But because baptism and faith go together, and because Tate is too small to accept this gift that God gives him today, we confess 
the, con the Apostles' Creed on his behalf today. And I ask us all to stand and confess these words together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into the realm of the dead. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From where he will come to judge the living and the dead, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the dead, and the life everlasting. nearly over yeah. because Jesus Christ freely died for Tate to free him from the evil one we bless him with the sign of the cross receive the sign of the holy cross Jesus Christ has redeemed you my dear parents Andrew and Crystal I ask you as parents do you want to have Tate Anderson share baptized in the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? And do you promise to bring him up in the Christian faith? Then answer, I do, with the help of God. Bianca, I ask you, as Godparent, do you want to have Tate Anderson share baptized in the name of God the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit? And do you promise to assist Andrew and Crystal to bring him up in the Christian faith? Then answer, I do, with the help of God. All the children may come to the front. You may all come stand here with us. I'm going to warm this water up a little bit because I don't think he'll like that. Buena feel. Is that warm, cold, hot? What's in here? It's cold. It's cold. Hey? Do you want to, can you reach? Let's see if we can make it a bit nicer for him. Nope, not warm enough yet. That's already much better. There we go. And now, you want to check? Is it good? Is that better? Lovely. There we go. Right, let us baptize him. And you can watch. Okay, all right. Sorry, I don't want to stand in front of the, God, the grandparents. Hey, there we go. All right. Tate Anderson Shear, I baptize you in the name of God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. May the Lord and Father, who is your Father, bless you with the giving of the Holy Spirit and renewal of your and renewal of your heart. Amen. There you go. There we go. Do you want to drive that? Let us pray for this little one. I think we'll do a quick prayer. <laughs> and then I'll pray for you as well. Heavenly Father, thank you for little Tate. Thank you that he is yours. Thank you that you will always walk with him and guide him and carry him. We ask that you fill him with joy, fill him with your spirit and a faith that never wavers. I ask that you bless the parents as well, Heavenly Father. Bless them with wisdom, but bless them with a trust in you, that you will be with them and with their son. In Jesus' name, amen. You are welcome to sit down if you want. <laughs> well done. It's not easy, hey? You did very, very well. And like I said, it's not a baptism. You may all be seated. It's not a baptism if the child is not really crying. So that's very normal. Lovely.
Dear congregation, please receive little Tate as your brother. Please don't forget to pray for them, to keep this family in your prayers, wherever God may lead them. You will always be linked with us, always, wherever God leads you. We pray really that God gives you joy and He's given you such amazing gifts already. Um, and that this journey through all the highs and lows that you experience is carrying and His guidance, that you may always know that He's there. Right, all those children that want to go to Sunday school are welcome to go. One of the teacher is not here right now, but they are there. Wenn Sie gehen möchten, dürfen Sie gerne nach Grace Place gehen. Aber Sie brauchen nicht, es muss nicht. It doesn't have to. I invite us all to sing the next hymn um, from the hymn book right at the back, 831. O baptized people, one and all. We sing all five verses. O baptized people, one and all. The Gospel reading is taken from Luke 15, the verses 1 to 3 and 11 to 32. (coughs) 
Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and set off for a distant country. And there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country. And he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come home, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes, come home. You kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. He ends the reading. Please be seated. We already conf uh, confessed our faith during the baptism. So I invite you to sing praise to the Lord, the Almighty, hymn number 442, verses 1 to 3.
Grace and peace to you from God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask that you speak your truth into our hearts today. Help us to listen, to hear, and to follow you. In Jesus' name, Amen. Please be seated. The prescribed sermon text for today is an old one. From Ezekiel 18, verses 1 to 4, 21 to 24, and 30 to 32. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you mean by repeating this proverb concerning the land of Israel? The parents have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, says the Lord God, this proverb shall no more be used by you in Israel. Know that all lives are mine. The life of the parent as well as the life of the child is mine. It is only the person who sins that shall die. But if the wicked turn away from all their sins that they have committed and keep all their statutes and do what is lawful and right, they shall surely live. They shall not die. None of the transgressions that they have committed shall be remembered against them. For the righteous that they have done, they, righteousness that they have done, they shall live. Have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked, says the Lord God, and not rather that they should turn from their ways and live? But when the righteous turn away from their righteousness and commit iniquity and do the same abominable things that the wicked do, shall they live? None of the righteous deeds that they have done shall be remembered for the treachery of which they are guilty and the sin they have committed they shall die. Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, all of you, according to your ways, says the Lord God. Repent and turn from all your transgressions, otherwise iniquity will be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions that you have committed against me, and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Why? Will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, says the Lord God. Turn then and live. Not an easy text to listen to, but important. Dear sisters and brothers, the people of Israel find themselves in the biggest crisis that they have ever faced. Not only were they deported to Babylon 1,000 kilometers from home, worse, their temple, their home, and the testimony to the God of the universe had been destroyed and their holy city desecrated. How could this happen? How could God abandon His people? How could Gentiles, these unbelievers and their gods, conquer their Yahweh? Dear God, as they reflected on their situation, listened to the stories of the older generation, the picture gradually became clear to them. God had given up on His people because of the wrongdoings of many generations. For too long had their ancestors ignored the warnings and calls of the prophets. And because of this, they were made to suffer the consequences. Their findings are summed up in the words, the parents have eaten sour grapes, but the children's teeth are set on edge. It fits with what the commandments state, that the children are punished for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generations. It is into this situation that the prophet Ezekiel was called to bring a totally new, different message. This proverb shall no more be used by you in Israel. It is only the person who sins that shall die. Although this is a bit of a relief, it is still a very harsh statement. 
If we were to stop reading at verse 4, the passage would leave us trembling. But in order to truly understand this, we need to read the whole passage as we did and take into account and seriously then take into account after that what Christ has done. And I'd like to unpack the thoughts under the following heading, sin and its chain reaction, forgiveness and a new beginning, living a life out of forgiveness. So let us begin. The statement of the sour grapes and the children that suffer the consequences holds true in many ways. What we do does have an impact on the next generation. We should not fool ourselves. Our actions have consequences. But the problem comes when a generation hides behind the faults of its predecessors. When we blame our forefathers for our situation and leave it at that, but then we are where the Israelites find themselves during exile. One can take this one step further and say, if we carry over sins from the past to justify the present, are we in the same boat as the Israelites? Paralyzed by the past, unable or unwilling to do anything about the present. One can apply this to quite a few situations. In South Africa, there is a tendency to excuse poor performance by blaming the past. Many relationships in marriage and also amongst friends break down because one party keeps score of the wrongdoings of the other and ultimately blames the other for the miserable state of the relationship. Even in one's personal life, one could follow the route that many do. People store in memory all the wrongs that they have done, all the failures, and regard themselves as failure and unworthy to be loved. It is true that our actions have consequences. It is true that in a relationship people hurt each other. It is true that past generations did take decisions and followed policies that caused a lot of hurt and damage. But if I only focus on that, then I am caught, stuck, imprisoned by the chains of guilt and wrongdoings and will never change. God wants to set us free from these. Through Ezekiel he says, For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, says the Lord God. Turn then and live. We read in the New Testament that God wants to break this chain. He sends His Son Jesus Christ to break the power of sin, to carry the sins of the world. And that leads me to the second point. Forgiveness and a new beginning. In this regard, Ezekiel 18 already has a New Testament ring to it. God is not interested in punishing and killing off perpetrators, but rather offers them the opportunity of a fresh start. When you think of any sports match, soccer or rugby, we had quite a few yellow cards yesterday. You get sent off the field, and when your time is done, you come back. It's gone. It's forgiven. Even a red card, you might miss a few matches, suffer a penalty. But when that punishment is gone, it is gone. In the Soccer World Cup, when you reach the final, all yellow cards and red, all yellow cards are forgiven so that each team can play their best players for the final. And in a way, that is like forgiveness. It's not on their record. They don't have to wear these yellow cards when they play. It's gone. It's no longer theirs. And this is how forgiveness is with God. It is gone. When Jesus took it, He took it into His body, and He suffered the anger and the wrath of God that we deserved. Isaiah 53 tells us that God poured out His wrath and anger on His Son for every horrible word that we spoke, for every terrible thing that we've experienced or done, for every crime, He poured out His anger on His Son. This is God, our Father. He did this so that we could have a new beginning. 
This is what God wants. He doesn't want us to live in fear of Him, as in real fear of someone who's a tyrant. He wants us to love Him, but also respect Him. And that is also what this passage is about. We may not misuse this forgiveness, but we often do it. Imagine in rugby there were no penalties, no red cards, no yellow cards. Players could do what they want. Imagine how many injuries there would be if players knew that they would just get away with it anyways. No penalties. But why do we Christians do that as well? We think that, ah, we'll we'll be forgiven. Every morning, God's mercies are new. And so, we also take this for granted and allow ourselves to live in ways that are horrible. I've had many people come to me and share experiences that they've experienced from church members, even in our congregation, in this community. Terrible things, where you think, wow, how could this happen to someone who loves, or from someone who loves Christ? It's because we hold God's grace in contempt. God is righteous and holy. Don't ever forget that. God does not want you to experience the destruction that selfishness causes or the hurt that you cause to others. And on the day of judgment, everything will be revealed. But He doesn't want that. He doesn't want us to experience His anger and His wrath. That's not what He wants. He wants us to be free. That brings us to the third point, to live a life through forgiveness. You think of Jonah and the city of Nineveh. God warned them, but they listened. And He turned. He changed. He gave them mercy where they didn't deserve it. Think of the the robber or the criminal that died next to Jesus. His whole life was one of crime and selfishness and brutality. We don't know what he did. And on the cross, he said to Jesus, remember me in your kingdom when you go there. And Jesus spoke forgiveness to him. And remember your own life. The many times that you've experienced God's mercy and his patience. That is what God wants. He doesn't want you to destroy your own life. He'd much rather and always rather speak forgiveness to you. Because that is the life that Jesus died for. He died so that we could be free. Not bowed down and afraid. Not carrying these scorecards in our pockets to remind us of how terrible we are. Throw those away. And live for Him. Stop doing what you know you shouldn't be doing. Stop hurting others. Stop acting out of selfishness or pride. Stop holding on to your anger when Jesus on the cross prayed, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Stop cheating on your taxes. Stop doing it. And treat each other with love and kindness and forgiveness. Stop being dishonest. You can start new. And you don't have to carry that guilt with you every single day. I never want to whitewash sin because it's so destructive. But with God, we can be cleansed of it and be clean. 
And today is the day of new beginnings. With little Tate washed clean, made new. And with every single one of us, we have the opportunity when we receive communion to be honest about what we have been doing, what we've allowed into our lives and our hearts and our minds. And to bring it to God. We have the opportunity to receive forgiveness of sins. I always viewed communion as, as a child. I, I, you know, this, we even had a slate, a, a chalkboard as a child. With, it came with our stationery. We had to have chalk and we did maths on it. I always imagined that, that every, every communion we, it was wiped clean. Not, not, you know, the end of the week when the chalkboard is pretty much just white anyways because it's not clean but with a wet cloth, wiped clean. And that is what happens with us in communion, if you want it. If you want to begin again and new, and to live in a relationship with God the way that He always wanted it, one of love from a child to a father, and from a father to a child, or a mother to a child, that same bond, that closeness, without fear, as a small child may. That it, God invites you to come to His table, and to come to Him, and to begin again. Don't blame your past for yourself. Take ownership of yourself. Only you are responsible for you. Take ownership of it. But ask God for His help and His mercy. And you can begin fresh and clean. Amen. And may the peace of God that transcends all human understanding Guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. We're going to sing Amazing Grace 851. During this hymn, the collection will be taken up for theological education.
I ask you to stand. Let us ask for God's blessing for all that He gives. Let us pray. Dear Jesus, everything that we have comes from You. Forgiveness, salvation, but even the bread, the food that we eat and the homes that we have, our health and our loved ones, our work and this community, everything we have comes from You. And so we give with thankfulness and cheerfulness. We ask that this offering may be a blessing to those that You have called who are following Your calling as students of theology. In Jesus' name, Amen. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you as we are, and every single one of us, Lord, every single one of us has been selfish or prideful. Every single one of us has sinned against you in thoughts, in our words, or actions, or in action. Lord, we are no better than those Israelites so many years ago. And that is why we are here. We ask for your forgiveness. Lord, we ask that you wash us clean and help us to begin to live for you. Lord, may our lives glorify you in everything that we do. Please forgive us where we have turned others away from you where they have looked at our actions and our life and how, what we do and think, how could this be a Christian? Lord, where we have caused damage, we ask that you bring healing. Dear Heavenly Father, you are our Lord. And we come to you because we know that it is with you that we receive forgiveness. Jesus, we know that it costs you great pain and suffering and even death because of our sin and selfishness. Your love and mercy are incomprehensible. That you, the creator of everything, love us so much, even though we turn away from you again and again, that you became one of us and you died on the cross for us. Lord, it is beyond our comprehension that you forgive us freely and that you love us despite of everything in our hearts and minds and despite you knowing everything. You love us. To you be all glory and honor and praise. Come into our hearts, Lord. Grant us new hearts through your Spirit. Lord, we, don't, we pray not only for ourselves today, but also for our fellow brothers and sisters, Lord, who are struggling in their lives, but not just through sickness and death and grief and loneliness or depression, but with sin and addiction. Heavenly Father, we ask for your strength. We ask for your healing. We ask for your guidance and love. Lord, we ask for this country of ours that also is sick. Forgive us where we have stayed quiet. Forgive us where we have held on to hatred or prejudice. Forgive us where we have failed to help our neighbor. We ask for healing in this country from the leaders right down to ourselves. 
for our economy and for the nature all around us. Lord, Heavenly Father, we come to you because we know that you are the King of kings and Lord of lords. To you be all glory and honor. In Jesus' name, Amen. We will now prepare for communion, and in a moment we will sing, Create in me, O God, a new heart. Communion, as I said, will be celebrated in front. For those of you who have the prepackaged uh, communion, you may stay in your seat. We will give communion to the groups in front in first, and then when they are finished, for those of you who are going to remain in your seats, I will ask you then I will share with you the words, the body of Christ and the blood of Christ, where you then eat and drink. And in this way, we will all share in communion together. Let us now sing together, Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. It is truly meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, with archangels and angels and with all the company of heaven, we praise and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them and said, Take and drink from it, all of you. This is my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance 
of me. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Everything is prepared. Taste and see that the Lord is good. I invite those who want to come in the first group to now come to the front. There is still space. Keep you as you grow strong and tall. May you always trust God that He loves you and is your Father. The blood of Christ is shed for you. The blood of Christ is shed for you. Christi Blut für dich vergossen. Amen. Christi Blut für dich vergossen. Christi Blut für dich vergossen. Christi Blut. Christi Blut für dich vergossen. 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 
Christi Blut für dich vergossen. In Psalm 32, verse 8, we hear these words. I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. May the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in true faith until everlasting life. Go in the peace of the Lord. Amen. Is there anyone else who'd like to come to the front? Otherwise, we will share communion. For those of you who'd like to remain in your seats, I ask you to stand as you are able. And I will share communion with you. Take and eat. The body of Christ is given for you. Take and drink, the blood of Christ is shed for you. Before we get there, I want to still speak a blessing for those who have received now. In Isaiah 30 verse 15, we hear this wonderful, wonderful promise. This is what the Sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says, In repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. In repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. May the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in true faith until everlasting life. 
Go in the peace of the Lord. Amen. Please be seated. I ask you to stay. The Lord be with you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Hallelujah. Let us pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for the gift that you have given us in communion. It is not just a fellowship meal amongst ourselves, but communion with you. In the bread and the wine, we receive your body, your forgiveness, your life. And we could begin again today. Wash clean. The slate is ready. So, Heavenly Father, we ask for your strength as we go out into service in this world. Strengthen us in love and in trust with selflessness and kindness. Let us dispel or let go of all anger and malice and hard-heartedness. Move into our hearts, we pray. In Jesus' name, Amen. Oh, in the peace of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you His peace. Amen. Please be seated. We're going to sing the closing hymn. Um, from 554 verses 4 to 6, just note the verses, 4 to 6, help Lord Jesus let thy blessing, and then we'll hear postlude, and everyone is invited to join us for a cup of tea or coffee. <laughs> 